All right, welcome to the Cosmopolitan Globalist podcast. Thank you very much. Um, Vladislav and Olga are both journalists and researchers. They're both in Kiev right now. And we thought we'd have them on to tell us what the situation looks like from Kiev. First, um, a round of emotional reactions. Vladislav, first. Hi, and thank you for having me back again. And thank you for publishing my piece on the Viking uh, uh, mob uh, confrontation in Odessa, which I really enjoy writing for my book from Odessa. Uh, that was up on the uh, the uh, Cosmopolitan Globalist yesterday. I'm really happy. I was uh, looking for a home for that uh, publication for a long time, a worthy home, uh, and uh, there could be no worthy home, obviously. So, how does Odessa seem to? Uh, how does Kiev seem to you right now? Um, from the uh, the question is from the elite standpoint or from the or from the ordinary people in the street. Well, I noticed yesterday you said that it seemed half empty, and then everyone jumped on you and said it's just COVID, man. Okay, look, there there is absolutely a COVID epidemic here. Olga will confirm this. Uh, there, it, it, nothing like I've like I've seen nothing else like this in New York or France or anywhere else where the entire elite and lots of people in the capital are sick with COVID all at the same time. Omicron is just ripping through the city. And it, it seems to me that a lot of people are staying home with COVID, but like a lot of people also just cleared out of town for a week or two weeks. To Verdacha, an ambassador that I was having breakfast with yesterday, told me that a lot of people uh, are, are just pulling their kids out of, out of their schools out of elite schools, that is, you know, people in the elite, people with money, that is in the, in the oligarch and sub-oligarch level, are just going off to Dubai or or London or or wherever for a couple of weeks to see what happens. The because embassy, of COVID or because they're about to be invaded percent. by Russia? Uh, because of Russia. Right. Yeah, but I think it's probably half percent of cave population because I don't know anyone like who have left and, or who have like, you know, pulled their kids out of cave, like really, literally anyone. Olga, our readers aren't as familiar with you, although I've been reading you for ages, and I'm really glad we have you on the podcast. Um, you are a researcher and a journalist who's based in Kiev and the author of a number of pieces recently that have been published in prominent Western outlets saying we're going to fight them with pointy sticks if need be. Um, why don't you tell our readers just a little bit about your background and what you're doing now? Yeah, uh, well, yeah, I'm a, I'm a journalist, like my main self-identification is a journalist because that's what I've been doing for more than 15 years, mostly working with the Ukrainian media. But in, in the uh, recent years, I've been also working more and more with international media. And I'm a freelance correspondent of the Spanish news agency EFE here in Kiev. And I also occasionally write for, uh, right. especially recently, for America and UK and other news outlets. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, uh, I mean, like why I was um, writing about this, that Ukrainians are ready to fight, this is not like, you know, something that I want to kind of promote or uh, um, just my like opinion, which is has no basis in truth. But since as a, I'm a reporter still, you know, and I go and like, talk to people and I went to attend territorial defense courses and I have like quite a wide uh, uh, you know, range of contacts from various uh, swaths of Ukrainian society, at least like he here in Kiev, right, maybe less in the regions, but I also try to talk to people in Kharkiv, how they feel and in other Ukrainian regions. And like the prevalent uh, sentiment and, you know, the, the response I get that uh, people are really uh, uh, getting ready to, uh, uh, to stay and to, to fight in their own way. So of course, nobody like, not everybody is prepared to take up arms and go to the front line or even enroll in territorial defense and like stay in Kiev or in other uh, urban centers to protect their uh, cities, villages from an eventual Russian attack. So a part of people are, are ready for that. And, and especially it's interesting because there are a lot of women, uh, even women in their fifties. Uh, I met some uh, women over 50 uh, at these territorial defense drills who joined like recently several months ago uh, after the previous Russian military build up on Ukrainian borders in spring 2021. So like what was, you know, uh, a swath of the society. So both in terms of gender, but also in terms of like their professional qualifications, uh, IT professionals, uh, uh, clinical researchers, entrepreneurs, football trainers, 
different kinds of people. So a, a part of the population who's like, you know, training to to resist uh, an occupation. And there is another part who says like, okay, how can I as a civilian uh, do some resistance, prepare for them some resistance. So these people go to attend uh, first aid courses and courses on the survival in the right. city if, during the war zone. So, you know, uh, from what I see, like a lot of people are really uh, thinking on these various scenarios, but not from the position of, okay, like I should just like grab my bag and run away, but like, no, okay, I will put my kids and my elderly parents in a safe place, and then I'll go back and I'll try to do everything I can, uh, you know, to contribute to the resistance. This is a very natural lead to a question that I'd like to ask you both. We are hearing a lot about military material that's being shipped to Ukraine, both from Europe and the US. And what I don't have a really clear picture of is the state of the mil of the Ukrainian military versus what it actually needs to be a, a reasonable fighting force? Can either of you give me a rundown? What have you got and what do you need? Yeah, I can answer that uh, based on my conversations with people from the military and military experts. Mm -hmm. So basically what they are saying that, uh, well, that's great, of course, that Ukraine has been receiving all these anti-tank weapons from the, from the US and from the UK. But what we are in the dire need of are uh, air defense, missile defense. Ukraine has some air defense systems, but they are mostly obsolete from the Soviet era. And Ukraine has none missile defense systems. Also, you know they've been requested? Uh, this, uh, they have been requested as far as I know, and there are, uh, there are talks going on. So Ukraine has been receiving some air defense, portable air defense systems, and the Baltic states, such as Lithuania, uh, Latvia, and Estonia, they said that they will be transferring to Ukraine the Stinger uh, missiles, uh, US made with the permission of the US government. But I we don't know that. What, How many what's do the need? size. Yeah, it's, you know, that's an open question. I, I'm, I, I'm not in a position to answer. I don't know if they will be enough. And anyway, they are uh, only that kind of uh, uh, air defense is not enough. And, and the problem of missile defense still, uh, still remains unresolved. And also Ukraine's another vulnerability is at sea. Right. So there, there has been a, a, an announcement by the UK several days ago that they will be uh, supplying some anti-navy missiles but still like there is a little clarity on that and uh, in terms of also of time you know do we still have time to when the when the shipment will arrive and uh, are ukrainian military uh, trained to use it like how much time will they need to uh, exactly. actually be able to use how it? long does it how much time does it take to train someone to use that kind of equipment a long time i mean a really long time and the, the if if something does happen it's going to happen within the next two to nine days i mean the the moment when the real problem from the country is now a, a lot of these systems are extraordinarily complex and there are all sorts of congressional buffers for exporting them uh, there these are expensive systems often they have um national security implications even to put them into theater right. it, it's very technical uh, you need you need to sign off from the american dod or the uh the british dod then you need uh, uh actually getting them into theater and then you need time weeks sometimes months to train local officers to use these very complex very modern systems this is not going to happen in the next week missile defense a Israeli type dome system is not magically going to be set up over Kiev and Kharkiv in the next eight days before the Russian army blows something up. I mean, so what do you need most of in the next eight days? What's realistic? No, uh, it's hard to say. <laughs> Let Vlad go first. Look, they, it, it, every shipment of javelins that they get is great because it increases the deterrence that the, that the Russian army general staff has to input, price in to their calculations of how many tanks are gonna get blown up. They already have a thousand of the uh, English made uh, pads, I think they're called. They have about 500 of the javelins now, although I don't know what the number is since the, the 13th or 14th plane load came in last night. The number's obviously bigger as of last night when we did just wake up. 
Yeah, I think it's 15, 15 planes from the US and uh, in total 1,200 tons of uh, ammunition. Yeah, but this, this is only ammunition and uh, handheld, or what by handheld we mean shoulder held, uh, hand targeted anti tank equipment, which is there to prevent a massive tank assault, a mechanized assault. The point of those rockets is to keep a mechanized assault from taking place and to cr increase the, the, the price for the, the, the Kremlin and the Russian command staff for when they, they price in the calculations how many Russians are going to die and how many tanks they'll have to replace in the next year. Right. That's right. the country that's not going to keep the Russian Air Force or the Russian Navy from doing things. And there's really nothing that we can do in the next week, week and a half in order to even out the tremendous disparity between one of the world's greatest air forces and the Ukrainian Air Force, which has 67 planes, most of them being cargo cargo planes. Just as a hypothetical, if Ukraine were a NATO country, what would be underway right now? Would we be able to do anything more? Well, I think if Ukraine were a NATO country, we wouldn't be in such a situation because Russia doesn't dare to, you know, threaten NATO countries. Uh, the Baltic states that are most, much smaller than Ukraine, but Russia, you know, knows that they are in NATO and it doesn't dare do anything uh, apart from like threatening belligerent rhetoric, you know. So, the, and instead, in in all the uh, um, other countries that used to be part of the Soviet Union, or like in most of them at least in, in those, in close proximity to Russia, there have been armed conflicts instigated by Russia. And, and these are the countries that are not in NATO. So I think if there was, if Ukraine was in part, a part of NATO in the first place, we wouldn't be, you know, in the situation as we are now in. I want to come back to that, but I want to ask first, if one of you would give me a rundown of the diplomatic activity we've seen in the past 48 hours because it's been quite confusing, and I'm not sure that all of our listeners will have been following in minute detail. Um, Olga, do you want to do that? Just explain what's happened in the past 48 hours. Yeah, yeah, sure, I will. I, I just saw that uh, Vladislav wanted to add something. Yeah, yeah, I'd love, NATO. I would love Olga to, I would love for Olga to answer that question because she just pasted a very thorough Twitter thread where she really goes through everything and she really, I mean, we, I mean, we both know what's going on, but that, that was really succinct and I think she should answer that. Just to, just to add something about military alliances. When the Soviet Union dissolved, mm -hmm. I hate when people say collapsed, it's a pet peeve of mine, it dissolved peacefully. For the most part, it dissolved peacefully, unlike, unlike uh, Yugoslavia, which collapsed violently. When the Soviet Union dissolved peacefully and when the Soviet era and when the communist era, minus, minus uh, some holdouts like China and Vietnam, concluded, when in 1991-92, the epoch of communism concluded, there were five areas in the communist world that did not wind up being in a military alliance. They were not embedded in a military or social alliance. I'm going to go through them. Uh, the rest of these countries, the CIS countries, the Baltics, um, uh, West, Western European, former Warsaw Pact countries, which had been communist, were all embedded in one uh, alliance, military alliance or the other. There were five countries that were not embedded in the alliance. They were Moldova, which was invaded by the Russians promptly with a, with a, a little green men and the Transnistrian situation. They were Georgia, we all know what happened there, 2008. They were Ukraine, which was invaded in 2014, and the next part of it. Uh, there was Armenia and Azerbaijan, which uh, quickly went to war and had a second war a year ago, a year and a half ago. And there was the entire space of the former Yugoslavia, minus, uh, uh, minus uh, of course, uh, uh, Slovenia, which, which got off easily with 67 dead. They, they got out of communism with only 67 dead people, as opposed to the rest of Yugoslavia. So when all those five spaces, within the next 30 years, experienced wars that killed lots of people, that's what happens when you are not in a military alliance. Five times out of five, all former communist 
nations that were not embedded in one particular military alliance had either civil wars, invasions, or uh, actually in almost all those cases, both. So Olga, please tell us what happened uh, diplomatically over the last couple of days. Run through the past 48 hours and I may lift up my hand to interrupt you if you speak of or about something that I don't think our listeners will fully understand, okay? Okay, no problem. Yeah, so um, let me remember what was 48 hours ago because I remember well what was 24 hours ago and that was uh, on the one hand the visit of the UK uh, Foreign Minister, Foreign Secretary Liz Truss to, to Moscow and her very cold and frosty exchange with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov who walked out of the room at some point and who said that it, uh, the conversation was like speaking uh, a, a mute person with a deaf person uh, uh, and also, the, there was it was revealed that Truss also made some uh, slip when uh, she mistakenly uh, confused Russian regions with those yes. in Ukraine and said that the UK will never accept Russian sovereignty in those regions. So some Russian trolling uh, the way uh, you know Russian see, uh, diplomacy, which is less, uh, uh, which is less and less looking like diplomacy, but more like this high level, very crude trolling and uh, also spreading a lot of disinformation and this kind of things. Um, and on the other hand, also there was a meeting in Berlin uh, yesterday that lasted for nine hours, the meeting of Normandy Four uh, advisors. Normandy Four is a format that includes Ukraine, Russia, France and Germany. And uh, the goal of this format is to try to find a diplomatic solution to the war in Ukraine and to uh, work on the implementation of the Minsk agreements, which is something that everybody's talking about, but very few people understand what these agreements are about. So th these are actually like the only kind of peace deal that is in place uh, now between Ukraine and Russia. They were signed the first version in 2014 and the second version in, in 2015. And basically they were signed at a time when Ukraine was suffering heavy losses and the Russian uh, military uh, attack aggression in Donbass and Ukraine and, and these agreements on the one hand like they were pressured they were imposed in Ukraine so they are not very favorable to Ukraine from that point of view and on the other hand they are also very vague so each side Russia and Ukraine interprets them in a different way and that leads to a stalemate and basically like uh, what was yesterday it was an attempt to somehow find you know uh, a path uh, on this, uh, how to continue these negotiations in Normandy 4 format, how to finally um, agree on the meeting of the leaders, which was the last uh, more than two years ago in Paris in 2019. And since then there has been no progress and Ukraine has been blaming Russia that it is actually Moscow that doesn't want to uh, you know, negotiate in good faith and is not willing to implement the security provisions of the Minsk agreements, which Ukraine sees as, as crucial and as those that should be implemented first and foremost. And those include Russia withdrawing its uh, military equipment from the occupied Donbass. It includes uh, a stable ceasefire. Uh, these provisions also include that Ukraine should regain control over its border and that the OSCE uh, special monitoring mis mission is given access to, uh, to do its work. And it, it basically has been like prevented from doing so for many, many months now by, by the Russian side. Now, Russia claims that Ukraine is not implementing which part of the Minsk Accords? Yeah, Russia, Russia on, on, the, on its part insists that uh, Ukraine should implement the political part of the Minsk Accords first. And that political part would include um, granting uh, more powers to these occupied uh, uh, territories of Ukraine. Uh, it would include um, conducting the elections there. And uh, ultimately that would lead to the presence of the representatives of Russian proxy republics in the Ukrainian parliament, in the Ukrainian police, uh, in the Ukrainian uh, justice system among Ukrainian prosecutors. Uh, and, you know, th this, this was always hardly palatable here in Ukraine. It also uh, includes amnesty for people who might have committed uh, war crimes against against Ukraine. So it was from the very beginning uh, very, you know, uh, unpalatable for a lot of people here in Ukraine uh, in the society, but also on the government level. But as I said, like the agreements were signed under huge pressure in the moment of Ukrainian military defeats. But 
over this uh, uh, seven years that passed since the, the last part of the agreements was signed, a lot has changed on the ground also in the occupied in Donbass with Russia giving a, a, away its passports. And uh, according to the recent estimates, it's about 600,000 people at least who now hold Russian passports and the occupied Donbass. So, you know, that, that makes like for the Ukrainian government, that's like another reason to be very reluctant to implement this political part because, well, they say, okay, first things first, first the security, like we, we have to like restore our full control over this area. There should be like no military equipment. Uh, there should be ceasefire. The, there should be control of the border. And then we will think about the political part. But even the political part is, is very, is something that would really undermine Ukraine's uh, sovereignty. Uh, is the official position of the Ukrainian government, yes to Minsk, but only if it's implemented in full in the way that we interpret it, or Minsk is now a non-starter because it hasn't been respected? Now, the Ukrainian position, the official position is that we stick to the Minsk agreements, like we are committed to implementing them, but Russia has to show progress in implementing the security part, because Russia basically violated the Minsk agreements, like the, the second, the next day they were signed with, uh, you know, shelling the Ukrainian uh, territories and violating the ceasefire. So the Ukrainian official position is, okay, Russia should like show goodwill and implement the security part, and then we will talk about the political part. Russia, uh, on its part, insists that the opposite should happen. That's why, you know, there, there is this stalemate and no, no really light at the end of the tunnel. So That's presumably the object of all this high level of diplomacy, of Macron's visit, of Liz Truss's visit, is to persuade Russia to take some step that could be seen as a good faith step toward implementing the Minsk Accords. I'm not sure actually about that. I think the main goal is now to buy time, you know, and like to, okay, pretend we are doing something. We are like attempting to have this uh, uh, diplomatic uh, way of uh, uh, communication, like that we should engage diplomatic tools to prevent uh, an escalation. So, uh, but I think there is like really little trust and hope in the West that Russia would be willing to uh, implement the, the, the security part because Russians have been said, they said on numerous occasions that they do not actually think it is like, this is a binding agreement that they do not actually have to, to do this. And even yesterday, Lavrov, when he was meeting trust, he made some like really uh, crazy uh, uh, analogies, like he said that, well, Russia doesn't feel like it has to implement uh, the Minsk agreements because the Ukrainian government is illegitimate, because there are Nazis uh, in the government in Ukraine. So, you know, like the worst uh, narratives of, of Russian propaganda that come in from Russian state officials. So no. Russia has made it clear that it's like really not willing to uh, to, to, to act in good faith in, on Minsk agreements. And I think, the, so the goal of all these talks now is mostly, I think, to buy time and, you know, to proceed on the negotiating track. But uh, how long... He all but said that there? yesterday. He outright said the goal is to buy time while we arm Ukraine. Did no you understand that. it that way? No one says that openly, come on. He did. <laughs> well, he all but said that. Did you see that clip? Uh, who no. said that, sorry? Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson. Uh, no, I didn't see that. Wow. Yeah, that's that's the truth. It's just that like everybody's scared to you know admit to this open secret that the Minsk agreements are really bad agreements, that the implementation of them would really undermine Ukraine, uh, Ukraine's independence and Ukraine's sovereignty. So this is something that who is familiar with these agreements knows very well. And for Russia, it's just a tool, you know, to have control over Ukraine. And since it, it, it's, it's not functioning. Russia is now using a, a threat of a, a military force. Now, let me ask, what's going on in the Black Sea? Oh, Vladislav, you have your hand up. I'd like to add that uh, everything Olga said is 10,000% correct. I'd like, there's one thing that she, did, uh, that she has not added. It is that there, the implementation in the Ukrainian parliament of Minsk II is completely impossible at this point with the numbers of uh, of MPs as they were elected. I had drinks with my MP from Odessa, Oleksiy Gincherenko, who's uh, a, a Poroshenko guy, last night at a restaurant. And uh, I also ran into the former prime minister in the same restaurant. I saw them both last night. Uh, in fact, there were the, 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 the restaurant, there was a party for... Uh, a birthday party for a well-known blogger and an 
and an MP. So there's just a, a bunch of MPs that I saw last night from all different fractions socializing. And I talked to all of them. They all said off the record the same exact thing. The votes are not there in the Ukrainian parliament for the implementation. Two, according to uh, the Ukrainian constitution, you need 226 votes to implement a law and 300 votes to change the Ukrainian constitution. There are, uh, it, this would require the changing of the Ukrainian constitution for parts it's of- It's two thirds of the Ukrainian parliament, sorry, just to interrupt to make it, put it into perspective. It, it's two thirds of the Ukrainian MPs. Right. They should yeah. Some of, the, some of the seats are empty because of the, there have been no elections in in uh, uh, fourteen for fourteen seats in Crimea and I think thirteen or fourteen seats they changed it in in uh, occupied uh, uh, DNR, LNR, and Donetsk and Lugansk. There are about 28, uh, 28 or four hundred fifty seats which are unoccupied. So there the 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 two thirds changes, but you need three hundred uh, votes constitutionally in order to change the constitution of Ukraine. That's what it would take to um, push through the Minsk Accord. Zelensky has uh, a, a supermajority, a, a, a single party supermajority in parliament. Half of his own party would not vote for such a law. He does not have control of his party for uh, something like this. Half of his own MPs would buckle and say no. There's only 40 pro-Russian MPs, let's say, uh, the two pro-Russian parties, who are actually Russian proxy parties, they have 40 votes, which is about 10 to 12 percent of parliament. They're, they don't have the votes to pass Minsk, Minsk II. It just doesn't exist. It is an impossibility. It is like voting for the leprechaun and uh, the Easter bunny and, uh, 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 you know, magical trolls to bring Ukraine uh, magical beans and gold. From their magical pots it's just an impossibility olga do you, do you agree yeah yeah i like your comparison <laughs> right um can you tell us a little bit about what's going on in the black sea well oh uh, hard, it's uh, hard because the news Vlad knows the, it because he has connections in odessa go ahead i'm a, I'm a black i'm a black sea guy i'm an odessa guy i do have connections odessa i'm, I'm from there my family's from there that's that's the that's the town that i have uh, the most sentimentality for and and the best uh, understanding of because Odessa, Odessa is a very special place and it's the name of my book from Odessa of Love. Uh, it's hard to say what's actually happening because we woke up to the Russians changing their their um, their rhetoric on actually doing live fire exercises. Some people think that they are calling off. No, but it, I think it was only about Azov Sea. They didn't say it about Black Sea. Uh, I th I think they're they're still going to have live fire exercise in the Black Sea. They just made the lane the shipping lane to to allow ships to pass through into Odessa wider because it looks like they probably don't want to trigger sanctions by blockading the ports. Blo as, as everyone well as as uh, as smart people know, blockading a port is an act of war. And Moscow maybe took a look at the fact that this could be the thing that actually snaps Western sanctions into place. So they, they kind of want to blockade everything in a, in a partial way. So they're having live fire exercises. But as of last night, they, were, they, they canceled some of the live fire exercises, or I think they moved them, or I think they moved the, the, uh, the lanes, made them bigger so that the port was open. It's unclear to me what's actually happening as of this morning because something changed last night. Uh, I think it's very important to say, I don't know when things are in flux and they are in flux yeah. at the mm -hmm. Well, how seriously should we take reports that shipping has come to a standstill because of these exercises? We don't know yet. Don't I agree know. with Vlad. Uh, the situation is very fluid. Like the, this, uh, the exercises between Russia and Belarus, they started yesterday. Right. And all these movements in the Black and Azov Sea, they also began yesterday. And there was this announcement also that they were calling off at least some of their activity in the Azov Sea. But this is like 5% of all the planned activity. So because 95% was, was to be happening in the Black Sea. And that as far like as I read uh, yesterday evening was still on the table. So the situation is really fluid, like we have to watch. Uh, I don't have anything to add at this point. The other, thing, the other thing about that is that at a certain point, it doesn't really matter when Western shipping companies say, oh, aren't there 
military maneuvers there and isn't isn't sh shipping insurance to the black sea tripling since last tuesday the the the, the economic damage is the point mm -hmm. the economic uh strangulation of these ports and the lack of understanding for Western shipping companies and captains about whether they're actually safe going in, into those ports is the point. And when you're in, when you're shipping insurance triples or quadruples overnight to ship something into into Odessa or uh, into uh, the, the secondary Odessa port, one 30, 30 kilometers away, uh, it, it almost doesn't matter if you're going right. to get fired or if the port is blockaded. That's the point. It's to it's the triple shipping shipping right. price. Right. And, and this leads directly to questions. Vivek, you had some questions about the economic relationships here you wanted to ask. I can't hear you. You're on mute. Still can't hear you. Okay, Vladislav, uh, you know, I was yeah. just looking at some of the state statistics service data, Ukraine state statistics service data from August 2021. That was the last one I found. And that data said China, Poland, and Russia are Ukraine's biggest trade partners. Correct. So is this, is this really a way to ensure that China is some 10 or 12%, for if I remember correctly, thereabouts? So is this really a way of ensuring that nothing comes in through the ports by blockading this part? Because then you're stuck with limited trade overlap. Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. It, it, it is the case that Russia, eight years ago, was Ukraine's biggest trading partner. That umbilical cord has been cut by the events of the last seven years. Slowly, the proportion of Russian trade and Ukrainian trade drops and drops and drops in both real numbers and in, in, uh, in, in, as a proportion of the total trade between Ukraine and everybody else. Chinese trade is skyrocketing. It's absolutely the point. Every year, there is a larger and larger volume, and there are larger and larger uh, shipments, and it's a larger and larger percentage of a total trade. So uh, I don't think the Russians are as concerned about that as they are in making sure that Ukraine does not embed itself into the Western world, as in, uh, as in w Western trade uh, uh, even outside of security, what, what really got the Russians going in, in, in 2013 and 14 Maidan and the invasion and the war was not any kind of entry into a security arrangement or a security alliance. It was the entry of Ukraine into a trade pact with the European Union. Uh, it is absolutely impossible to be po both part of the EEC and uh, the European uh, free trade pacts. It's just, uh, it's just impossible. And uh, it's important for Russia in order to keep Ukraine from being formally integrated into Western trading relations. This isn't about China. China is not the problem for them. It's, it's the increased trade with Germany and Poland and uh, other Western European and Eastern European states. So the, the Chinese, sorry. Hmm? sorry, go ahead. The Chinese are not the problem for them. The and they're no, not. My my question wasn't about the Chinese being a problem. My question was essentially about trade. And then in your piece a couple of days ago, you made some good uh, points about foreign direct investment. Yeah, foreign uh, foreign direct investment from the Chinese is going up tremendously, as it is from uh, the Europeans, and the, the Chinese are. Uh, very strategically investing in all sorts of things like grain elevators, in infrastructure, and in building the, the new uh, ring of the metro stops in, in Kiev. They put a lot of money into agriculture. They, they very selectively invest in uh, Ukrainian infrastructure and uh, security companies. There, there, there's a, a very interesting long-running um, problem dialogue with the Americans about them putting uh, trying to buy Motor Siege, the Chinese, the the uh, military engine, the, the military plane engine maker. The Americans even put sanctions on um, uh, on Motor Siege, and they tried they tried to have another bid, and then they made the uh, the uh, the uh, Ukrainian state give back the Chinese their money. The Chinese sued. The Chinese are very, very active in this country. They see an opportunity. They are putting money in. 
Often it's good. It's good when they buy up agriculture, although the Ukrainians do not allow them to buy up land. And this is still a, a, a very controversial uh, thing here. They do not allow the Chinese to buy up land. And when they try to allow the Chinese to buy up important security companies, the Americans intervene. So uh, trade is, in fact, a political issue with the Chinese. What about direction of trade from the other side? What about the trade coming in from Europe? What's the how's FDI, foreign direct investment from Europe doing? How's that compare at all? Or how, how is that actually aggravating the situation for Russia? Look, the FDI that the, that the Ukrainians want or plead for is not coming in in the numbers that they want. They, they, it's just, um, it's, it's more or less plateaued over the last couple of years. They, they, they want FDI, but there's a certain level where it uh, stops coming in because of uh, concerns from Western companies about the, not even corruption, corruption's a problem. It's, it's, it's about the, the courts. The courts are not ones that I would personally want to litigate my business in if I was a Western investor here. The courts are not to be trusted. So the FDI, FDI runs into a natural problem with the politicized nature of uh, not independent court systems. This comes out very clearly in the piece that we ran yesterday, um, your piece about the Viking who established a rune stone. It's a very, it's a very funny little piece, but it also ex gives people a good sense of what it's like to do business in Odessa. And that's an important point. But you are suggesting something that some of people have been speculating, that perhaps the point of Russia's military buildup is not to invade, but simply to make it impossible for anyone to think of investing because of the, the inherent instability. And you seem to be suggesting the courts itself would be sufficient to do this. It's not, it's not sufficient. If, uh, without Russian compellence and military might and uh, aggression and coercion, without the Kremlin's coercion, sooner or later, if allowed, to develop naturally in its own direction and a kind of, you know, in a, in a healthy way. The Ukrainian state will be fine in 20 years. The Ukrainian people are resilient, they're hardworking. They, they, they are, they're, with all the many problems here, they're looking towards the future. They're looking towards, uh, uh, towards good, good goals, given uh, a healthy situation and without a aggressive Northern enemy, right. this country will be fine. They are moving in the right direction. It'll take years. Olga, am I right? Olga, that's what I want to ask you. What do you think of that theory that Putin has already achieved his objectives? He doesn't need to invade. The goal is to ensure that Ukraine remains an economic basket case, which he's done very effectively, simply by keeping his troops in, this, in the position they are and keeping attention focused on the possibility that he could invade Ukraine. Well, I think he, he achieved actually the opposite of what he wanted. Like if we look on a wider perspective, you know, I think he didn't expect such a unity from the West, like strong NATO position. And actually it was very interesting that Russian envoy at yesterday's talks uh, in Berlin, Dmitry Kozak, he said uh, in comments to, to the Russian media that they were very disappointed, Russians, that Germans and, Fran and French didn't put enough pressure on Ukraine like to push Ukraine to concessions. So I think from that point of, point of view, Putin actually achieved the opposite. And also from the point of view of like strengthening Ukrainian defense capabilities, like all the arms that have been flowing in to Ukraine in the last weeks, Ukraine has been asking for these weapons for years, you know, since 2014. And there was like huge reluctance in the West to provide them because they said, well, this is going to provoke Russia. But what provoked Russia is weakness is not you know the active stance but like this reactive uh, position and doing nothing and pretending to do like business as usual so now like this uh, uh, arms are flowing in that would like strengthen Ukraine's defense capabilities and like regardless of what happens still you know it also boosts the morale of the Ukrainian people because like they the people are more confident somehow that there is support and also in, in, they trust more in Ukrainian armed forces, which is anyway like the, highly, the most trusted Ukrainian institution. But uh, it, it, speaking about the economy, yes, you, in the short term, Ukrainian economy has been suffering like now from all this news and the tense situation and the GDP forecast has been re uh, revised into, uh, you know, to a negative uh, 
more to the uh, negative side. And uh, uh, there are concerns in the Ukrainian government, and also it's partly the reason why Zelensky and the government of Ukraine are trying, you know, to, to put forward this message that, okay, uh, nothing has really changed, and then this threat is being exaggerated by the West. So they, they try to somehow calm down also the investors and businesses here in Ukraine, so they do not escape, like, uh, or they do not like change their plans. Uh, of investing in the Ukrainian economy. So on short, in short term, this had an impact, but I do not think, you know, Russia has uh, enough resources to sustain this military threat for, for a long time. So very soon, I think in a matter of like weeks, two weeks until the end of February maximum, Putin will have to decide, like, is he going to attack or not? And if yes, what kind of attack that would be? I do not believe in a full-scale invasion. I believe more in a series of hybrid attacks, military combining cyber attacks and uh, probably terrorist attacks and some things to, you know, undermine Ukraine from within. So in yeah, the I long term, I think this strategy Krem will not function. I know you're not a Kremlinologist. I know you're neither of you are. But what do you look at when you try to figure out what Putin is thinking? Uh, uh, that question has given rise to a thousand op-eds. Yeah, what I is... know. But what, what, what do you look at? When, how do you approach that question? Um, you know, day by day. I mean, I, I, really, I really try to think through what does he actually want uh, that other people have not said. There, there, this question has been asked ad nauseum. Um, I mean, basically, you have to start with the higher the higher end goals, which is personal survival and regime survival. And the regime is, is a, a regime is a basically a, a, a corrupt quasi quasi mafia state, basically with with no with, with no legal uh, structures. I mean, it does have legal structures, but it also has weird things that other states don't do like private militaries that that the, the the president has the capacity to give out money and passports uh from a black budget the russian state does all sorts of things that 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 normal states don't do right the 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 capacity to give out treasure and investments to friends the, the capacity to use private uh, private uh, instruments of war and private PMCs, private military companies, uh, giving out billions of dollars from slush funds, from a quote unquote black uh, budget. So uh, Russia is a postmodern state with things about it that are not normal in terms of political science. There are there are aspects of the of a contemporary Russian state which are not normal because it's it's uh, you know it's a, it's a state melded with essentially um the uh with the mob it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a mafia state uh, it's a godfather uh, intelligence state the, it's run by intelligence services which have fused with with the mob right that's that's that this is what it is plus it has it has no particular ideological characteristics except survival it has it has moods it has um I mean, great. I mean, Greater Russia and the, the greatness of Russia and Russian chauvinism and Russian nationalism are the ideology, but it doesn't really have a coherent political ideology. We don't. Is it is it monarchist? Well, sometimes it has elements of monarchism. Is it revanchist? Sometimes it looks back to the past. Is it capitalist? Yeah, it is capitalist, except it it it's against competition and it's completely inefficient because. X amount of resources are given over to non-capitalist goals and corruption. So what is the character of a state? The character of a state is regime survival and the survival of the people who hold a lot of capital. That is his main, that is his number one priority to answer your question. And you have secondary priorities which prop up that priority in, in, in terms of a house of cards, right? Uh, which, which is the uh, the greatness of uh, the Russian near abroad, which is keeping uh, his paranoid fantasias about um, about everyone being out to get Russia from taking place, and thus acting in ways that actually make those paranoid fantasias come true. Um, you know, what does he want? He wants to survive. He does not want to see his private palace pillaged by the popolo the way that the way that he watched probably with horror 
uh, of people playing golf in Yanukovych's palace in 2014. That's his main. That's his main goal is to keep people from running into his palace and play with his with his toys and watch his video cassettes and uh, and and play with his pet ostriches. That's his main goal. So everything else has to um, flow out of that. Every other insight has to flow out of that. The Although, what do you look at that when you is... try to figure out what's what's Putin up to? What are the things you keep your eye on when you try and figure out what he's going to do next? Yeah, uh, I think Vivek wanted to react to what Vlad said. No, that's said. okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I, I actually I agree with with Vlad uh, that uh, I think Putin's main goal is to cling to power and to preserve his kleptocratic regime. This is something I, I wrote about before, and I actually don't see a lot of people sharing this opinion. They mostly tend to think that uh, he's ideologically driven, mm -hmm. but I think his motives are really you know more are more down to earth. Uh, and that's why I think also the um, uh, why the threat of uh, uh, that you know that, that was floated uh, by some in the West of going after Putin's personal uh, wealth in the West of going after Putin's inner circle wealth in the West of, of you know like uh, cutting access to their uh, children to their education in the West and uh, even cutting like uh, uh, visas. To Russian, uh, to the Kremlin officials or people close to to Putin, that has provoked like a really angry reaction from from the Kremlin, from Putin's spokesman Dmitry Peskov. That while they you know shrug off all the other threats of sanctions and they say, well, we are now sanctions proof, like in in other areas of SWIFT. Okay, we don't care if you disconnect us from SWIFT, but they really wouldn't want to lose access to their enormous wealth in the West and their ties in the West. And I think this is also, you know, the, the, the main weakness of the, of the Putin's regime because it is not an autarkic country. It is not North Korea, you know, they do not like, okay, he has this posh palace on the Black Sea, but he's not willing to refuse, uh, you know, his villas in Sardinia and his yacht in Germany that has been moving towards uh, towards Russia in recent days. So he cares about those kind of things. He, he's, a, he's a down to earth, after all, person and all this uh, uh, ideological narratives of you know rebuilding the Russian Empire or Ukrainians, Russians are one people. They are very contradictory because like they, it directly contradicts the things, other things like they say and do and put in himself said and did in, in the past. So these are just used as a tool. But the main goal is to cling to power forever and to preserve this kleptocratic regime. So how does menacing Ukraine fit in with this? Uh, you know, in order to preserve the regime, uh, he has to, like, he, he's, he proved, like, completely unable to transform Russia from within, like, to, to you know, uh, ensure any kind of uh, uh, increase of, like, the benefit, the welfare of the Russian people. Uh, and, and, and as a former KGB agent, and I know if there are, like, former KGB, like, once KGB, forever KGB, uh, he does what he knows best, you know, like all these subversive operations in the West and also the military aggression against neighboring states. It just serves him to consolidate his power inside Russia, to hold the people of his inner circle tied to him because also they have a lot to lose. Like if all the war crimes and everything is exposed and comes to light, you know, well, that, that could be like really, really uh, uh, painful. So by uh, compromising also the the his like the so-called elite and making them engaged in all this uh, very dirty murderous uh, wars and operations in, in, abroad he kind of consolidates these people around him and he uh, uh, you know consolidates his regime right right we had an article by Nicholas Hender who made a very similar argument recently on a scale of one to ten question for both of you how pleased are you and how pleased are Ukraine with the support you've received, respectively, from the United States, from NATO, from the EU, and from the individual countries of the EU? So let's go point by point, maybe. Mm -hmm. Which one is first? <laughs> EU or US? Go on, let us know. No, Olga, Olga answer. Let's unpack that. I'll, I'll, I'll okay. pipe in. On a scale of one to ten, how do you rate the support you've received from the United States? 
Well, I think it's uh, uh, about eight or nine, probably. With the Agreed. UK closer to 10. UK closer not, to 10. Not exactly, because they, they are failing to combat the kleptocracy in, in London. And right. that's a crucial, that should be right. like a crucial right. element of, you know, deterrence. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they are very unwilling to, to lose access also to to this uh, funds and a lot of people. It's a tangle, it's a web, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the connections that are entangled. With the with NATO and the EU and individual countries, I think also the expectations in Ukraine were lower. There is a huge disappointment with Germany, of course. Yeah. And it's interesting that there is less disappointment with France, although France has not been supplying uh, defensive weapons to Ukraine either and yeah. everything all that Macron talked about during his uh, recent visit to Kiev was just some uh, cars for, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the border patrols or the emergency situation services. So something like civilian, mostly like not military, but civilian uh, kind of uh, assistance. Uh, if I could just interject with a quick question. I saw um, an interview with Schultz in which he said, but we must note that Ukraine didn't ask us for anything but helmets. Is that true? As far as I know, it's not true. Right. It's not true. Okay. You asked them to stop Nord Stream 2. That's a big ask. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, as for, have you requested any other military items? Well, uh, I think uh, people in the government should be addressed this question. I'm not, uh, you know, in a position to answer that. Right. The Ukrainian government understands very well the history of... Uh, the German psychological response to war. They also have a lot of questions to the Germans who say World War II, World War II, when they were, are in fact the ones who took the brunt of the, the killing uh, along with the Belar Belarusian people and the, and the Belarus Soviet Socialist Republic uh, from the German army. And they yeah, understand- A, a position that Tim Snyder has explicated, expli explicated extremely well. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah Tim, Tim is the best on that argument in the world. Uh, I like Tim. Uh, in fact, when I had my magazine, The Odessa Review, I published uh, Tim's speech in the Bundestag in my magazine about what, what the, the Germans own, owe Ukraine. So Tim is very good on that. Uh, but it, it's okay to not provide weapons when you have that kind of history. That's one thing. But to close off airspace to... Uh, uh, to British flights to make them fly around and to even deny export licenses to Estonia who are giving over 35-year-old, 45-year-old howitzers which used to be owned by the East Germans to, to Ukraine. That's just ridiculous. That's beyond the call of anything. That's, right. That is such fence-sitting that it is utterly ridiculous. That's not, so where that's would not, you rank them on a scale of 1 to 10? 3. Three. Right. What about the EU generally? Eight. Eight? I mean, yeah, uh, look, the, the EU is playing good cop and bad cop. I, I do think that at this point, the, the Americans, the, the, the British, the Germans, and the French have divided duties. Mm -hmm. I do think that, the, that, that uh, there is a very much synchronized kabuki dance in terms of negotiations. Macron uh, was the obvious candidate to do the dirty job and he did go to Moscow and had the unpleasant the unpleasant uh, task of having to sit there for six hours in a socially distanced away from President Putin and uh, get get lectured about um, uh, cra the craziness of uh, uh, of Putin's worldview for four and a half hours um, you know that, that's an un unpleasant task but it is a pl pleasant for his re-election, of course, which is in two months. But it's an unpleasant task to have to fly to Moscow and sit there for six hours and get and get basically hectored for four and a half of those hours about uh, historical grievances, which is what happened at that meeting. And then afterwards being told by uh, Putin at the presser in front of the entire world, he just hectored me, you know? <laughs> so uh, it, it seems that the EU and the Americans have divided uh, positions so they're playing good cop, good cop, neutral cop, bad cop, and Macron had to do something very unpleasant and maybe you know unseemly, but they they are now putting together a coordinated campaign. I don't know if, if it's the correct 
campaign, but it is certainly coordinated in terms of which positions are taken by which which presidents. Vivek, you had a few more questions. I want to give you a chance yeah. to ask them. Yeah, please. Uh, you you were talking about Germany and France and Europe in general, but again, the issue there seems to be, at least for an outsider like me, it seems to be economic. Um, Putin's played a great game on gas and he's got that gas pipeline in place. And then the gas transit revenues that Ukraine's been losing over the last several years. How is that playing out actually? How do you see, what, what reactions do you see and how much of that influences Germany and France? Because I would normally have thought that Germany and Poland are the two neighbors would be immediately affected if there's a war in Ukraine. Lithuania, yeah, that's a great question, good sir. Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia also have tremendous problems. Lithuania, Lithuania now has a tremendous security issue with, with the Russian troops in, in Belarus. Lithuania now has very serious issues. The Poles are obviously very, very uh, scared. The closer you are to the Russian army, the more you're concerned uh, in terms if you're a, a European uh, country. So there, there is a school of thought that says this is all just a faint in order to occupy Belarus, or this is all just a feint in order to increase pressure from the Kremlin in order to push through Nord Stream 2 to get the certification from the Germans. There are analysts who think that way. I'm, I'm not one of them, but I, that, is, that is a serious argument. That is a serious school of thought. Uh, it, it is the case that the Germans very stupidly turned off all their nuclear power reactors, and they are now completely dependent on uh, imports of, of, of gas for their heavy industry. They need, uh, they think they need Nord Stream 2, even though it's not going to increase capacity. That's the, the Ukrainians' great argument. Uh, Nord Stream 2 is a both a political and an economic project for the Germans, and they are stubbornly clinging to it. Even now, the Germans at this point have not yet said that, they're, that, that Nord Stream 2 is off the table. They keep saying, well, it's on the table, but we will talk about it in case of a, a Russian invasion. But they well, don't actually... In, in, Schultz the was Americans, standing right the by Americans Biden when Biden said, Biden. if we invade, it's, it's not going to happen. And he agreed. Yeah, but Schultz was not very vocal on that himself. Yeah, he kind of nodded when Biden said it, but he wasn't the first like to say it. So, uh, and and a lot of like, even today, I saw that the some politicians in Germany still continue talking about Nord Stream Two, uh, that it's a commercial project and it like shouldn't be affected and things like that. So there is still no consensus as far as I see in, in Germany on that. And about the in general the energy dependency of the European Union on Russia. I think this is one of the major reasons why there are such discrepancies within the EU on how to approach the current situation. The countries that are more dependent on Russian uh, gas supply, such as, well, Germany, as we said, but also Italy. And Italy also has a lot of business links with, with Russia. And President Putin actually uh, last week uh, spoke uh, via video conference to um, uh, major Italian businesses in a move that was not agreed with the Italian foreign ministry. And actually the, the government, the foreign ministry reacted to that just in the morning of, the, of this meeting. And they asked the CEOs of these businesses not to attend and only some of them pulled out. but many others were in and uh, it, uh, CEOs of Italian energy companies, any Enel uh, have strong links both with uh, Gazprom and Rosneft. So uh, Russians are playing divide and rule, you know, with the US as they as they did before in the previous year. So now they are continuing the strategy. They are looking at weak, weak links in the European Union. And here we can also mention the Hungary and the visit of uh, uh, Prime Minister Orban to Moscow uh, before Macron. He was uh, put at that long table. <laughs> Uh, in, in which basically he, he, he recognized that Russia has legitimate security concerns and, and almost almost sided with Russia on, on the current standoff. Right. So, you know, th there are these divisions inside the European Union, which actually make its position much weaker and more ambiguous. And from the Ukrainian point of view, it really undermines trust 
uh, in, in the ability of the EU, you know, to act as a whole, especially if Russia undertakes some kind of hybrid attacks on Ukraine, like via Belarus, which would give her plausible deniability saying, okay, this is not us, this is like Belarusian military that is reacting to a Ukrainian provocation, something they've been setting a stage for uh, in the recent days and weeks. And it is quite likely that if something like this happens in the EU, there will be countries ready to kind of believe or turn a blind eye to, to the fact that it's actually Russia who is, you know, now has control over Lukashenko and all over his forces. And we try to you know, kind of put those sanctions on, on hold or at least uh, argue that they should not be as strong as if there was like an overt Russian invasion. So Russia is just, it's playing this divide, dividing game in the EU. And unlike with the US and NATO and the UK, it is functioning with some EU countries that, that you know, have been long uh, penetrated and polluted by uh, Russian corrupt money. Right, right. Vivek, you've beyond, got your hand up. Beyond the, uh, beyond the EU, what about the other Southern European countries? Because they, there's a pipeline there that's getting a little less attention than Nord Stream, the pipeline that's coming from the South into Southern Europe. So how was, how was that? You mean, you mean the Bal sorry? Balkans? The Turk Stream, the Turk Stream. The Balkans. The Balkans, yeah, you mean Balkans. Southern European countries, the Balkans. Yeah, but then from the Balkans, they come into the other parts of Europe. Those pipelines are interconnected. Uh, look, the, the, the pipeline politics, the energy politics, is extremely complex. It's very difficult to explain um, uh, the, the, the energy politics. It, 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 the, the market stuff is very, very, very complex. Um, I, know, I know a little bit about it, but the, 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 uh, the, the, the actual politics of, of, of the gas in, in Europe is, you know, it would take two hours to explain all, all the various things about capacity. And uh, I, I'm not sure we have the time. Well, we're running out of time, so I want to I want to ask one final round. Just one round of last question on gas. Sorry, yeah. Claire. Just one last question on gas. Uh, the gas transit revenues to you through Ukraine. What's the future of that? Where do you see those coming? Because those have been a critical part of Ukraine's economy. Well, yeah, look, uh, the the even without the events of the last, let's say, six months the actual number has been dropping the 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 um the number is i think is down to 1.7 billion last year it was uh, as much as 2.83 billion a, a couple of years ago the, the the numbers have been dropping and the uh again it's very complex but the the, the actual uh, organically over the last 4 years the the, the number uh, the number the actual transit fees that the Ukrainian naphtha gas gets from, from their Russian counterparts have been dropping. And the price of gas is tremendous now. And the Ukrainians did not stock up on gas when they should have a year and a half ago when, when, when gas prices were very low. They, they had a surplus that naphtha gas had, and they, uh, there was a, a big political conflict over, over, over what would happen with that surplus. And that surplus was reinvested into politically useful projects in terms of uh, the re-election. But the, uh, in terms of actually creating more capacity in Ukraine and buying up gas for the underground storage tanks, which the uh, Ukrainians use uh, in order to store gas for um, uh, the winter, that was not, that, that decision was not taken. So the, 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 amount of underground gas that is now sitting in the storage tanks, uh, the winter storage tanks in, in Ukraine is going down. And the, the, the Russians have spot orders on much of that gas. And so I think the Ukrainians now have about a, a month's worth of uh, uh, reserves, at which point they would have to uh, close off the, um, uh, the national industry that they were if, if they were not able to buy enough natural gas for re reverse flows on the spot markets like i said I, I think it's a very 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 technical question and it, it's um it, it's technically difficult to explain i don't want to confuse people 
but the, uh, the, the short answer is that the R Russians have been pumping less gas and buying fewer, um, uh, uh, less capacity in the, in the gas net, uh, transit network system than they have access to uh, for political reasons. Even though at a certain point, if they stop pumping the gas, they stop making money. So they're not entirely capable of using the, the gas transit system as a political tool because they still need to be making money for the Russian treasury. But it, they have been using less of the Ukrainian transit capacity over the last couple of years, and they would, they would like nothing more than to use none of it to punish the Europeans and the Ukrainians. Olga, do you have anything to add about it? Yeah, I, ju I just wanted to add that actually it, it has been clear in the last months that Russia has been using gas as a weapon. And uh, but remarkably, this debate on that is non-existent now because everyone is like focusing on the Russian military buildup. So the, the, the provisions of the agreement reached between the US and Germany last uh, summer, they actually uh, compel uh, these countries to act if Russia indeed uses gas as a weapon, which Russia has been doing, but there has been no reaction. Uh, and this issue is now, you know, and not on the table or tense in the items, or, you know, in, in the priority list because of the Russian military buildup. So that's like another uh, kind of part of Russia's strategy, uh, uh, distract from the problems that were already there, create new problems, then pretend you solve the problems you just created. So everybody forgets about like all the other ones. Okay, a final question. Vivek, do you have any more? What are the top journalistic cliches that you would like to see retired when you read about this situation? Ukraine is a deeply divided country. <laughs> <laughs> Post-Soviet Ukraine, ex-Soviet Republic. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. That's like in general about Ukraine, not just about this current situation. Vladislav? Divided between the East and the West. Oh, I know. <laughs> Has it ever occurred to anyone that we are all sitting between East and West, no matter where we are? Geopolitical struggle between Russia and the United States or Russia and NATO. So like Ukraine excluded from the conversation. And this is something I really note a lot in, in, in Italy, for example, in Italian media. Like I speak, I speak fluent Italian and I follow the media scene, like what, what they are saying, what they are uh, writing. And that's something that's really prevalent there. Like the Ukrainian position is not taken into consideration. There is little, very little understanding of what present Ukraine is. Like all the concepts about Ukraine are outdated. They are in the best case are relevant as of 2014 when the correspondents were last here. Uh, and you know, was when Ukraine was the last time in the news before this uh, current crisis. So I wish, you know, um, there was more awareness of the changes in Ukraine that has been happening in this uh, last eight years, mm -hmm. because really the transformation has been enormous and Ukraine has shown incredible, incredible resilience. So despite, you know, the economic losses inflicted by war, despite the human losses, despite the uh, humanitarian uh, impact of, of the war, still uh, there was a consolidation both of the Ukrainian society, national identity, civil society has been growing stronger, is having, is having more and more impact on the government decisions and on the ability, you know, of the government also to backtrack on some like laws that are perceived as harmful for Ukraine as a democracy. Uh, uh, we had uh, several free and fair elections recognized by international observers. Uh, in general, we have free media, of course, like with all the problems that media now face all over the world uh, with the, you know, competition from the big tech and the lack of funding and the advertising revenues that, that are falling. But in general, a lot of progress has been done and I wish this wasn't, you know, overlooked. And actually now when I see like a lot of foreign correspondents here in Kiev for the first time since 2014, I'm happy that at least partly, you know, the situation and the extent of this Ukraine's transformation, it is reflected. Good. Um, Vladislav? Uh, that's, that's all very good. I'm all just, right, should uh, we close with a quick message for Tucker Carlson? Oh, you know, can I get myself almost canceled in the West? Go I, for it. 
I believe in the Tucker Carlson, Green, Glenn Greenwald, uh, 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 Brown Red Alliance. I uh, not on Ukraine, but I I do believe that they're completely right in the fecklessness of the Democratic Party, neoliberalism, the decline and degradation of American elites, the disgusting oligarchy that has been built in America. Tucker Carlson and Glenn Greenwald are entirely correct about these things, and I know it's not okay to say these things in polite liberal society. As a Ukrainian, uh, as a Russian liberal Ukrainian nationalist, whatever whatever it is I am, I'm very complicated, I'm so complicated, I don't even know what I am. I, I, I just wish that Tucker Carlson was not pumping these very, very, very noxious arguments, because he is a uh, America firster and, and a... Um, you know, an isolationist of a classic American variety. I wish he was not pumping these arguments into the American uh, ecosystem and creating impediments to, uh, you know, good sanctions policy in the United States Senate. He's really doing a lot. But he of is bad. doing that. Doing tremendous bad. I don't know where he's getting these arguments. Those arguments are. Russia Today. He seems to repeat exactly what he reads in Russia Today. And it, they recycle then, then they, because they translate him and put him on Russian state yeah. TV in yeah. Russian. So it's, you know, it's a perpetuous movement. We don't, we don't know where he gets these arguments. I mean, the, there has been some interest in trying to figure out what the pipeline is from the Russian overmind into Tucker Carlson's head. But he is an isolationist. He is an America first guy. He is someone who's been chastened by his uh, uh, defense of the Iraq war. He is someone who uh, has seen what happened in Afghanistan. And again, I, uh, you know, he is a absolutely xenophobe and a, um, and uh, certainly some sort of, uh, you know, is he a racist? Is he a garden variety racist? That's a question we're not going to be, we Ukraine hands are not going to be solving now. I, I think probably he is a, uh, a, a xenophobe uh, and a, a, a guy who wants to close off the American border. Uh, certainly. Whether he's a racist is a different question. Whether he's bad on Russia policy, that's absolutely correct. He is absolutely not wrong on the oligarchy that has been built in America by the, uh, uh, you know, he, I mean, he was chastened by Russiagate also. I mean, the, for him, Ukraine Gate is an outcome of Russiagate. This is a, a little, a, a, a younger daughter or younger sister of Russiagate. And he was, you know, of course, standing up to Russiagate, where, where the entire American... I think this is a little peripheral to the question, which is his oh, saying we should take Russia's side. It, it's so peripheral, but I, I absolutely despised what the American legacy media did in terms of Trump and, and Moscow. They debased themselves. They beshat themselves. They uh, ruined 50, 70, 80 years of accumulated cultural and political capital for uh, a petty vendetta. And, you know, I, I'm not a Trump voter, but I, I just, as a journalist, I prefer not to destroy the media in order to make it a wing of a partisan attack machine. And Tucker Carlson responds to that. And if he's overplaying his hand in response to Ukraine because of that whole dynamic, I get it, but I'm not happy about it. Olga? I think there's nothing to add. <laughs> okay. All right. Shall we wrap it up with that? Vivek, you have any more questions? Well, I'd just like to talk to the two of them next week about gas, because I think that's a really crucial issue. Okay. Should we do that? Why don't, we'll, get, we'll get someone like Alan Riley. We'll get a really great... Oh, Alan is fantastic. Actually... Yeah, uh, yeah that would uh, be uh, good. Several, I don't know. I, I'm completely lost in time. I don't know. It was last week or the the week before. I moderated an event on the North Stream Two at the Ukrainian uh, Institute in London online event, and a lot of interesting points were made there. Uh, Rebecca Harms, a former German member of the European Parliament, participated, and uh, also Andres Umland, a German uh, professor based here in Ukraine and uh, uh, a journalist who specialized in energy issues, Aura Sabudas. And uh, there were a lot of interesting points. So I will just share the, the link with you and then we Please. can depart I'll from look that. Forward. All I'll right. Look forward to it. Thank you both very much. I spoke over you, Vladislav. I didn't hear you. Uh, sorry, uh, Claire. It, it's very difficult with, with Zoom. It's uh, all, all, not always elegant way to communicate. 
unlike Claire, who's always elegant and who's my, my neighbor in Paris and who I love. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you so much for having a very intelligent Olga as an interlocutor. Thank you for coming on. It's delightful Thank to be your you. neighbor. Good luck. Keep us posted. Thank you for having me. It was nice to e-meet two of you and we met with Vladislav in person several days ago. So it, it was great to join your company. Okay, great. All right. Good luck. Bye. Bye-bye.